Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins and welcome to Life, Death and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium and here we explore life, death, consciousness and what it all means. Today I have Steve Taylor on the show. Steve is the author of Extraordinary Awakenings and many other best-selling books. He is senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University and the chair of the transpersonal section of the British Psychological Society. Steve's articles and essays have been published in over 100 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers, and he blogs for Scientific American and Psychology Today. Welcome, Steve, to the show. Hi, Amy. Great to be with you. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank those of you who are supporting the show via Patreon. I literally could not do this without you. It means so much to me to have any sort of support for the show, but really the financial support is super helpful to me right now. I'm an independent podcaster. This is all being funded by me. So anything you can do to help that, if you love listening to the show, if you love the content I'm creating, if you love the guests that I'm having on, please support the show. I have amazing, amazing guests continuing to come on the show. I'm so excited. I've grown the most month over month in the past three months, and that is because of all of you sharing the podcast, telling people about it. So thank you so much. Anything you can do to support the show, I am so, so grateful The growth I know is going to help me in some way. I'm not exactly sure how yet, but I know it will. Thank you all for listening. And here's this week's episode. Well, we're going to have a lot to talk about. First of all, starting with if I only knew that there were such things as transpersonal psychology when I went to grad school. That's like the biggest bummer of my (laughs) (laughs) my psychology career, I think. Right. Yeah, it's... um... You know, it's not a very well-known field in psychology, but I think it's getting more influential, you know, as time goes by. Yeah. Yeah. More people are certainly interested in, in these, these experiences. So can you start, let's start, because your book is about your research and transformation through turmoil. So can you start by defining for us how you differentiate um, post-traumatic growth, PTG, as people may have heard, heard it called, from transformation through turmoil it's uh, it's similar but i would say that ttt is a very um it's a type of post traumatic growth but it's a very extreme and intense form of post traumatic growth post traumatic growth normally occurs very gradually over a number of years and it enhances people's characters you know it, it develops them in certain ways but transformation through turmoil It's a very radical transformation, you know, people to the point where people feel as though they are a different person living in the same body. And it occurs not always, but usually it occurs very dramatically and suddenly in a single moment of transformation, often after a diagnosis of a serious illness like cancer, often following a bereavement after a long period of addiction and in many other traumatic situations. So how instant would it be? Like, can you, can you describe for us? I know you talk a lot, you, you give a lot of um, case studies in the book, but can you talk about for us what that would look like and how instantaneous it, it it actually is? I mean, it's like suddenly someone has this experience and the next day they are totally transformed. Even more sudden than that, you know, some people can locate the exact time when it happened, you know, the exact minutes, even if there was a, you know, if there was a clock or a watch nearby. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's almost as if there is a certain moment when the normal ego dissolves away mm-hmm. following a long period of trauma and turmoil. And, you know, when that happens, it's usually a very sudden event, just like a house collapsing in an earthquake. Um, you know, there's a certain moment when it occurs. It, it may have been building up for a long time, um, but there's a certain moment when the whole structure collapses. So it is, it's a moment of ego dissolution, but it's not just ego dissolution. It's also the birth of a new self. It's not just a breakdown, which is ego dissolution. It's a shift up. It's the, mm. it's the uncovering of a deeper spiritual self, which was always there, but it seems to have been dormant, just waiting for the opportunity 
to emerge. So many people could locate or spe specify the exact moment when it occurred. So is it a psychological phenomenon? Is it a spiritual phenomenon? Is it separate? Is it like unknown? What is the sort of specificity behind it? I would say it's both. I mean, I guess transpersonal psychology, you know, brings together the spiritual and the psychological and it treats them, you know, as part of a, a spectrum of human nature. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the, the dissolution of the ego is probably, you could say, it's a psychological phenomenon. The ego is a psychological structure mm -hmm. that we develop to function in the world. And it normally does a good job, you know. Well, hopefully it does a good job until we go through tra trauma and turmoil, then it may start to break down. But when the ego breaks down, it's as if a bigger self arises it's as if the ego the normal ego is a kind of quite a restricted and limited kind of self that's just on the surface of our beings but when the ego dissolves away something bigger and wider seems to emerge so it, it, it's a bit like um you know the whole of the ocean suddenly suddenly appears rather than just the surface of the ocean if you like and we become we become aware, become we become aware of these depths of our own being rather than just living on the surface of our minds um, and as to why it occurs, is it, it is a bit mysterious. I mean, if you read some of the stories in my book, they seem almost miraculous because, you know, it, it is such a radical, miraculous change that some people undergo. Um, you know, well, one person, for example, she experienced a sudden transformation straight after being diagnosed with cancer, straight after she emerged from the consulting room. And suddenly it was a revelation that, um, that life is temporary, that, that death is real. And that she was only in this body for a certain amount of time. She was only in this world for a certain amount of time. And she, it never occurred to her before. She had just taken life for granted. So suddenly everything looked completely different. Everything looked more beautiful. She felt this sense of connection to other people, mm -hmm. to her surroundings. She felt, she felt that you know, life was a miracle and it was a gift, even though she'd just been diagnosed with cancer. Um, so, but I mean, I, I think my theory which I suggest in the book, is that it's due to a breakdown of psychological attachments. Mm. Psychological, psychological attachments are mm -hmm. things like um, ambitions, um, sense of status or success, possessions, beliefs about the world, all of the things which give us a sense of identity, which so create our sense of who we are. It sounds like the personality qualities dissolve and the soul qualities really come into full force in that way. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. Yeah, the kind of the little personality, the surface personality seems to fade away. But something bigger seems to arise in its place. So how do you define what it means to awaken? In my view, awakening is pretty simple, really. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we complicate it in a lot of ways, right? We think it's like this like nirvana yeah and we we sort of dress it up in all these different concepts and it appears in different ways in different spiritual traditions but i think basically it's pretty simple it's uh well i define it as an expansion and intensification of awareness mm -hmm. and that can occur in a perceptual sense your, your perception of the world around you becomes more intense the world becomes more real more beautiful more fascinating it's uh, it can it also occurs in a effective or in in a sense a subjective sense that you feel um you know your, your own awareness of your own being becomes deeper and richer and also your relationship to your relationship to other people becomes richer and deeper more intense because you become more empathic more compassionate as if, as if boundaries are falling away and you're connecting with other people and also to nature mm -hmm. and to other living beings and also, even in a conceptual sense, your awareness becomes wider and more intense. You have this sort of global perspective. You know, you're no longer so concerned with your own egocentric issues. You know, even you, or even the issues in your community or your society. You're you're concerned with global issues. You have a global perspective. You don't have really a sense of group identity. But so, in all of those ways, your awareness becomes more intense and more expansive. And yet. The pieces, one of the things that you said was that your boundaries sort of fall away. 
But but do you in some way then have a better sense of you in relation to to all of this? Is that it? Like boundarylessness is not the best thing either. But it sounds no. like it's like a deeper connection with a, all of these pieces. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you don't cease to exist as an individual, even though in mm. some spiritual traditions, you know, they, they do suggest this. There's this whole thing about non-duality, which suggests that you cease to exist as an individual and become part of this wider whole. But I think that's too simplistic. And, you know, and that would lead to dissociation, even possibly psychosis, because I think you need psychological structures to function mm -hmm. in the world. You need a sense of identity to function in this body, in this world. So you don't lose your sense of identity, but you become connected at the same time. It's a bit like a wave, you know, wave mm. on the ocean has its own form, even its own identity, but it's connected to the whole ocean. It's connected to every other wave. It's just it's both things. It's both individuation and connection. Mm. You feel your own identity, but you also feel your connection to all other things. Mm -hmm. So how can you talk with us a little bit about the different ways that you found that people come to transformation through turmoil? Like what were the, the main kind of areas in which that happened? One of the main areas which surprised me was incarceration. I found a lot of examples of transformation in, in prisoners. So we should get incarcerated? Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's the best way to pursue a path of spiritual development. <laughs> well, you know, seriously, monks do that. You know, they, they even live in cells. Monks, you know, voluntarily isolate themselves from the everyday society mm. and limit their, um, limit their contact with other human beings. So, you know, it's the same principle, really. It's just that prisoners do it involuntarily and probably... Not, you know, in comparison to monks, not very many prisoners undergo transformation, but a significant number do. Mm -hmm. I found many, many cases, both historically in places like the Soviet gulags, when people were living in terrible conditions of deprivation. Even in the, the Nazi concentration camps, I found cases of transformation. But also, most importantly, um, in terms of my own research, I found many cases in present day prisoners. And I think, you know, what, one reason for that is that when you are a prisoner, you have to let go of everything. Everything which gives you an identity is outside the prison walls on the other side. And that's one reason why prison is a terrible experience for many people, because they have to let go of their possessions, their ambitions, their roles, their relationships, everything which gave them an identity. So for some prisoners, maybe the ones who are more prepared to go into themselves, to explore their own inner being that can be transformational that letting go and that self-reflection you know in prison you get a lot of free time and there's a lot of inactivity and solitude so that encourages self-exploration and self-reflection in some people and but also i found cases in soldiers due to the the stress and turmoil of, of battle mm -hmm. and also the, the you know the encounters with death if you're a soldier you know, you're faced with the danger of death, you encounter death, that can be transformational. But probably, I mean, obviously not many people experience uh, imprisonment or military conflict. Right. Um, but in terms of everyday experiences, which most human beings undergo, bereavement is probably the most powerful transformational experience. Everybody experiences it. And many people also experience at least personal uh, post-traumatic growth, but also possibly transformation through turmoil. Do you, I know you also talk about NDEs in here. And I think that the example that you give is actually someone that I interviewed a long time back, David Ditchfield, who had oh, yeah. a really powerful, um, my podcast with him was train wreck. Um, yeah. He had a really powerful incident where he was dragged by a train. And mm. what came from that was just remarkable transformation for him. Yeah, yeah. He's a really good example of um, how near-death experiences can be transformational. I mean, I, I differentiate between what I call intense encounters with mortality, which is when people have a close brush with death without necessarily having the, you know, the experiential content of a mm -hmm. near-death 
experience. So that could be like a you know, diagnosis of cancer. It could be some form of accident. In themselves, those kind of encounters with death can be transformational. Mm -hmm. like like the the lady i mentioned previously she you know it's when you stop taking life for granted and become aware of the the preciousness the temporariness the fragility of life that's a revelation it can be transformational but when you have an actual near-death experience as well which is when you you see yourself leaving your body you're out there in space you have a feeling of you know incredible well-being occasionally people meet deceased relatives or beings who seem to give them, provide them with wisdom. Mm -hmm. So when you have that encounter with death, plus the, the content of the near death experience, it's, it's, you know, it's probably the most life changing type of experience human beings can have. And David is a really good example. You know, he, he completely changed in, in every way in terms of his, his attitude to life, his behavior, his relationships, even his creativity. Yeah, he, and, um, maybe I'm not sure if you went, if you went into that, but he became, very creative he started to do paintings mm -hmm. to try to depict his near-death experience and he, he he composed classical music to mm -hmm. try to describe depict it in sound which he obviously he'd never done before right i was going to say and he was not a classical musician or an artist no he had been a like a, a guitarist in a kind of new wave band but not classical music right Yes. so is there anything that we can do without having these experiences to transform or to connect with that? Like, how do we, seems like a lot of people are just kind of waiting. They're waiting for that transformational experience to happen versus is there like a groundwork we can lay to help make it happen? To, to, an, to a certain extent, yeah, that's one of my aims of the book to try to work out why these transformations occur and try to apply that to our own experiences. Because, you know, we're all gonna face trauma and turmoil at some point, we, we have done already, we will, we will do so again. It's part of human life. So to a certain extent, it depends on how we respond to trauma and turmoil in our lives, because it's clear that they have transformational potential. They have a golden core of transformational awakening potential. But how do we get to that golden core? So one, one important, um, one, one important quality is acknowledgement, which means that when traumatic experiences occur, we have to open ourselves to them, you know, face them, which is difficult to do. We have this instinct to avoid, I call it the avoidance impulse. Mm -hmm. We have an instinct to avoid, you know, challenging states of mind or challenging situations, the same way that we want to avoid pain when it arises in our bodies. But it's much more helpful if we can actually face up to the situation in all its reality, no matter how difficult it may seem, even if it's a diagnosis of cancer or even if it's bereavement, you have to accept the situation, you have to face up to it. Maybe you need some, some support to do that, but if you can face up to the, you know, open yourself to the full reality of the predicament. And also, you know, explore the way that prisoners do sometimes, explore your own being and your own reactions, go into yourself and just explore, even if you feel negatively about situation, which you will in these situations, but explore your, your negative emotions, just observe them. That's very important too. But the most transformational aspect is a mode of acceptance. If you mm -hmm. can open yourself and surrender, let go of any resistance to the situation, in a lot of cases in my research, people could identify that moment of acceptance, that moment of letting go, just opening themselves to the reality of the situation. That was often the moment when transformation occurred. So, yeah, so I think if we embrace, if we acknowledge and accept traumatic experiences and situations of turmoil, then we're much more likely to undergo both post-traumatic growth or transformation through turmoil. Well, it's interesting because as you're speaking, I'm thinking of an interview I did a while back with Jeff Redinger, um, who wrote this book, Cured. And one of the things, because he was looking at spontaneous remissions, and one of the things that he found was that when people let go of their fears, of the belief that we're immortal, of, you know, and they started to accept their life and change their life, like 
you know, this, this woman that you talk about in the book with cancer, it's like an instant transformation. And sometimes Mm -hmm. they had, this isn't, this isn't a prescription. This isn't to say, you know, go and just accept, and this will happen to you, but it allowed for healing to happen at a cellular level. Yeah. Interestingly, that was one of my findings too. There were some people who uh, had been plagued by ailments for years, like digestive problems, uh, chronic digestion, uh, like colitis and other conditions, mm-hmm. also chronic back problems, really severe back pain that stopped them exercising. And when they underwent transformation, those conditions spontaneously disappeared. Um, so that, yeah, I, ne- I didn't really expect that, but that was definitely a, um, a strong theme of my, my research. Another thing was that addictions would disappear as well. And people who were mm. who had suffered from addiction for many years to alcohol or drugs, they would undergo, undergo transformation and the, the craving for the substance would disappear. So they would no longer have to struggle with addiction. So what did you attribute that to? What do you attribute that to? I attribute that to the birth of a new self. In the case of addiction, you know, the addiction is carried by the self which is which has died which the the ego which has dissolved away so the new self which is born doesn't carry any addictions because it's just completely newborn so that's really the the only way to explain it you know Mm -hmm. the 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 self which carried the addiction has died and so the addiction itself has died in a similar way with the um the medical conditions we we know that a lot of medical conditions are psychological you know that at some level they're generated and sustained by by the mind yeah. so so again once the normal self dies away those conditions those mind created conditions mm-hmm. fade away as well mm-hmm. it's fascinating yeah so in your book um you quote i'm going to say this wrong sui sri or yeah. bendino bendino and sri arabindo Aurobindo. Okay. Sri Aurobindo. And you say, he says, she says, they say, he, he he says, if humanity is to survive, a radical transformation of human nature is indispensable. Where are we now with all of that? (laughs) In my view, we're in a pretty bad situation, really. You know, there's so much conflict in the world still. And obviously, in terms of um, the way we're, we're treating the environment, the kind of damage we're doing to the environment, it's pretty severe. And uh, yeah, the, the world has always been in chaos for the past few thousand years, basically. Mm-hmm. It's just that now there's so many human beings and we're having such a big impact on the planet, the chaos is getting a bit dangerous. But, but I'm, I'm optimistic as well, because I think there is a, a shift in consciousness underway. I think the awakenings I talk about in my book are part of that. I think, you know, the only way we can survive as a species indefinitely, the only way that we can survive or flourish is by, by transcending, you know, our normal, our normal sense of separateness. Mm. And most human beings live in these sort of enclosed egos in, inside their own bo- minds and bodies in separation from each other, in separation from nature, with their own agendas, which compete against each other. But when people undergo awakening, they transcend separation. And they feel a sense of connection, a sense of empathy towards other people, towards living beings, towards nature. And it changes everything. You know, you live in a spirit of cooperation, a spirit of responsibility with empathy and compassion and responsibility. So everything changes. You know, relationships become much better. Uh, Our treatment of nature or other human beings or anything becomes much more responsible you know, we sense the sacredness of other people, the sacredness of all things. And that's really the only, the only mode in which survival is possible indefinitely. I think, you know, we can't just keep on exploiting the natural world, killing other species, exploiting each other, competing with each other. You know, it's bound to end in in chaos and catastrophe. Kind of sounds like where we are. (laughs) Yeah. Chaos and catastrophe. Yeah, there's definitely a trend of spiritual awakening, though. So, you know, there, there is. And, and I think this podcast is evidence of that. Right. People are interested in understanding and knowing. And they're there. I believe their souls are all of our souls are crying out. 
I think so. I mean, well, one of the things I suggest in the book is that we are undergoing a collective transformation through turmoil as a species. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we are in a not dissimilar situation to that woman who was diagnosed with cancer, you know, facing the, the prospect of disease and catastrophe in the future as a species. So that may be, just as it had an awakening effect on her, it may be having an awakening effect on us as a species. And that may be why over the past 20 or 30 years, there's this progressively increasing wave of spiritual awakening. Maybe it's a reaction to the potential trauma that we're facing or the trauma we are facing and the potential catastrophe it may lead to. And everybody doesn't have to awaken, right? Just enough people that it kind of tips the scales. That's right. Yeah, I think it, you know, once, once you get to a certain point, it, it will have an effect on all the whole human race. My theory is that once a certain number of people shift into a state of wakefulness, the, the momentum will increase for wakefulness as a whole within the whole human psyche. Mm. So it will become easier for other people to do it. You know, and eventually it will become a human being's normal state. Eventually, all human beings will naturally be in a state of wakefulness. Oh, well, that would be a beautiful thing. I hope yeah. it happens in my lifetime. Well, it's the inevitable trajectory of evolution. You know, evolution from the beginning of life on Earth has been about increasing and intensifying awareness. On the physical level, it's about complexity in living beings, more variation. But internally, living beings have become progressively more, progressively more sentient, more conscious, more aware. So spiritual awakening is really just a continuation of that process. It is a, a process of intensifying and expanding awareness. So it has to happen at some point, maybe not in human beings, maybe we'll fade away, maybe in some other species in the future. But, you know, it is happening inside us collectively at the moment. So maybe, just maybe, there's time for it to come to full fruition. Well, Steve, are you up for a quick speed round? Yeah. Okay. Just some fun questions I like to do at the end. Spirituality means? Expansion of awareness and connection to other living beings and the whole of the natural world. What's something most people don't know about you? I am a musician. I used to be a singer and bass guitarist in rock bands. Ah. <laughs> I, still, I still sing and play the guitar. Did you tour? In public. We did. Um, yeah, to an extent. Yeah, that's how I ended up living in Germany because we did a tour of Germany and I met a girl in Germany and moved over there. Uh, mm. Always a girl. Always a girl. <laughs> that's what romance does. What is one thing you are really looking forward to right now? Ooh, I'm really looking forward to swimming in the sea, in the ocean, because I'm uh, going away to Spain in a couple of weeks. Where in Spain? I'm going to Mallorca. So I love swimming in the ocean, but I haven't, I haven't done it for over a year. So I'm really looking forward to it. Probably a little cold near where you are. A little cold, but you can get used to it. You get used to cold, you know. Unfortunately, I do. Although I don't know that I'm used to it still. <laughs> what is one thing you are deeply grateful for right now? Uh, my children, because, I mean, I, I'm always grateful for them, but they're, grow they're growing up now. They're growing into teenagers and they're, they're such lovely boys. And I was just thinking about them today when I was at work and I thought, ah, oh, my kids are great. They're such lovely. They've grown into such lovely people. And I really do appreciate them. Such lovely guys. Oh, how many do you have? Three boys. Okay. Age 12 to 19. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, have, they're all great. And they're, and they're I have different. two boys. I have a 12 year old and an eight year old. And I have a daughter. Oh, right. 15. How, how, 15. Oh, right. So yeah. Three kids as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing it's, how they grow into different personalities. And it's, it's fun. I think I'm, I've been saying this lately, like I'm a much better parent to older kids, to like this age kids than I think I was when they were little. So it's been right. really fun for me. Yeah. The, the good thing about, the good thing about it is that they become your friends, you know, yeah. they're not, re not really your children anymore. They're your friends. Right. And and, and then they just, tell you things about yourself that you're like not super proud of. And you're like, wait, <laughs> stop yeah. calling me out on my stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. They're very honest as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotta get, gotta do more therapy on that. Um, what book is on your nightstand right now? Ah, I am rereading one of my favorite novels. It's called. It's by an English author called John Fowles, called The mm. Magus. Mm. It's a great novel. It, it's. Um, it was written in the 1960s. It became a bit of a, a classic in the hippie generation because it's very, it's quite mystical and esoteric. Ooh. Um, and it's incredibly long. It's about 600 pages. Oof. But it's just so rich and it's so beautifully written. It, it's full of like nature mysticism, so many beautiful descriptions of the natural world. And there are so many kind of deep Jungian psychological themes and some sort of spiritual themes. It's a really wonderful book. It's, there's so much in it that you can read, reread it many times. What's it called again? Just the Magus. The, the Magus. Magus? Yeah, M-A-G-U-S. Okay. Magus. What is your favorite spiritual or healing practice? Uh, I have a few, actually. I, I love to meditate. Um, but even, maybe even more so, I like to go running in the mornings. And that, that's a kind of spiritual practice, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's connection with nature. I run by the river close to where I live and it's great to see the the sun shining on the water in the mornings and you know as long as it is sunny but um <laughs> yeah but it's just it's great to connect with nature and after a while you know you get into the rhythm and it becomes easier and everything looks more real and more beautiful so mm. it's that's great swimming as well and you biked do you do triathlons too you told you said you biked home you swim you run yeah, Sounds like not, triathlon not training. No, not not officially. Maybe I should because I'm, I'm doing it anyway. But no, I do. I like I like all, all all exercise really. You know, I like lots of exercise. I play quite a bit of sport with my kids. Play soccer with my kids. And tennis. What is the most transformative experience of your life? Wow. It was probably. When I was about 25 or 26 years old, when I was a musician, I was living quite a kind of hedonistic musician's lifestyle and you know, drinking a lot. I mean, when you're a musician, you do, you do so much waiting around. So you get bored and everyone starts drinking. And by the time you, you get to play your concert, you know, everyone's, everyone's quite drunk. And, but yeah, it, it wasn't really a lifestyle which was congruent with me. So I felt quite depressed and frustrated. I knew something wasn't right. I smoked a lot, drank a lot, always stayed up late. But one night, um, I just woke up about four o'clock in the morning. I'd been drinking the night before, but I felt really clear headed and really healthy and alive. And it's very difficult to describe. But I had this experience where I felt as though I was out of my body, but also mm. inside my body, but I was somehow everywhere at the same time. And I just felt this tremendous sensation of harmony as if everything was completely perfect there was nothing to worry about everything was in a state of harmony and perfection and I just felt so I felt as I was like floating on this ocean of, of bliss probably a bit like the way people describe near-death experiences mm -hmm. and it was like a reminder that you know I kind of lost my way and it sort of brought me back to myself I remember waking up the next morning thinking wow you know I can still feel it inside me this sense of harmony and oneness. I thought, yeah, this is the way things are. There's nothing to worry about. You know, this is, you know, this is perfection. You know, there are no problems. Everything is fine in its essence. So it kind of brought me back to my spiritual self and encouraged me to change my lifestyle and stop drinking and, you know, live a healthier lifestyle. So was that your TTT? I guess it was in a, in a way. Yeah, it, it did happen in a, in a time of frustration and depression. Mm. Well, Steve, yeah. if people are interested in your work, where can they find you? You have your new book out it's called Extraordinary Awakenings, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. Where mm -hmm. else can they find your work? Um, they can find me at my university uh, in England, but you know that, that may be difficult for people to get access to. But they can find me uh, on the internet at stephenmtaylor.com. That's Stephen M. Taylor, St Stephen with a V. M for Mark, stephenmtaylor.com. And I have lots of uh, materials and poems and articles on my website. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your wisdom and insights and everything about 
transform transforming. Thank you, Amy. It was a pleasure talking to you. You too. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.